What is happening? Welcome to the Grail. It is Friday and it is episode number 37. Today we are taking a look at the world of air cooled Porsches from none other than the legend himself, Mr. Rod Emery of Emery Motorsports. This guy is the king of fabricating and taking old 356 Porsches and turning them into modern day madness, but keeping the beautiful original look of the 356. There is no better than this man. And I went to his shop and absolutely lost my mind. And I cannot thank this guy enough for taking time out of his insane schedule to sit down with me for an hour and talk about all things Porsche. A full-blown education I got from this man, and I absolutely love him. Do yourself a favor, visit his Instagram. It is Rod Emery, and that is R-O-D-E-M-O-R-Y. He takes old, old Porsche bathtubs, which is the nickname for him, those kind of uh, squished-looking VW Porsches, the original Porsche before the 911. He is the originator of the Outlaw Porsche. I want to tell everybody I'll be in Sacramento next week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That's 29, 30, 31 at the Punchline. And also, this just in, I will be at the La Jolla Comedy Store September 10, 11, 12, headlining, and uh, a bunch of Bill Burr dates coming up also. Connecticut, that is, uh, when is that? August 13th, and I will be in New York City at The Stand August 9th through the 12th. So yeah, New York City, my first time back since the lockdown. Feeling good, stay healthy out there, and uh, have a great weekend. And also do yourself a favor and uh, check out my Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey for all the bonus episodes. There is 109 up right now, and you can Zoom Fest. CactusRadioNetwork.com for all of your Del Rey podcasts. At Home with Byron Katie, Dark Fonzie, The Grail, and Let There Be Talk. This episode is brought to you by... The incredible artist himself, M.B. Leathers. I got another belt from this man, and I've been wearing it every day. His belts blow my mind. M.B. Leathers, tell him I sent you. And it's Instagram, M.B. Leathers. Get yourself a belt, some custom motorcycle seats, or saddlebags, or a vest, a keychain, the world is yours in leather. Check it out, MB Leathers. All right, here he is, the master of the Porsche 356, Mr. Rod Emery. Yeah, my name's Rod Emery, and uh, I'm the owner and, uh, of Emery Motorsports. We're a Porsche racing and restoration company, and I've been doing this for about 27 years. Thanks for having me on today. Let's get a little bit into this. I walk around your place. First of all, I want to give a shout-out to Jay, who uh, hooked this up, Rockabilly Jay. Uh, I've been a, a, a Porsche fanatic, you know, but obviously... Uh, I'm trying to learn more and more about it recently because I'm re way into the 993s. But growing up, I was I was way into James Dean, and of course, uh, you have some of those styles out there. What do you have, the Speedster or the Spider? Yeah, in the shop, but primarily 356s, which were the steel-bodied cars. Right. Uh, you know, we've got about 20 of them in the shop right now, uh, and then a couple of cars that are uh, aluminum-bodied cars. Uh, I don't have a, a spider in the shop at the moment. That's what but he crashed in, right? He, he, yeah, he crashed in a 550 <coughs> Spider, which was Porsche's um, street legal race car from uh, you know the early 50s. And uh, but yeah, the the 356 Porsche, you know, they started making those cars 
the end of 1948 in Gmund, Austria, and uh, that was really the start of the company. That's the, the so the 356 is the first car they put out. It is, yeah. There was the the 356 model is the first car that they put out, and they they hand built 50 of these cars uh, over wood bucks in Gmund, Austria. Uh, and they built 50 road-going cars, you know, cars for the street. And then they built uh, 13 of them that became race cars. Well, actually, 11 that became race cars. And then everything after that for their production cars were steel-bodied cars until they did the uh, 550 Spider. So, yeah, so what you see in the shop, uh, you know, these 356s, they ranged from 1948 to 1965. So that's the run. Yeah. And, and, and during that run, is that the only body style uh, they're doing? The ba- it's known as the bathtub, right? Yeah, it's known as the bathtub, but within that 356 model designation, there were a number of different cars. There was the uh, there were there were coupes, then speedsters, cabriolets, roadsters, just like uh, now. Yeah, but they all fell within that 356 body style, and it wasn't until 1964 when the 911 and then the 912 came out that they had another production car. Uh, the 550 Spiders that, you know, and the Spiders that came out, those were built throughout those years, but they were really race cars that, you know, you could drive on the street uh, if you wanted to, but, the you know, they were marketed more uh, towards the racing Yeah, they the had no car. roof. Your head just stuck out there. If you Ex- rolled, you were dead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it looked like speed racer car, yeah, kind of. right. You know, without the points. Yeah. And the, so the 356 model, they built a total of 76,000 of them. Wow. And they were, and they were all- From all those years. From all those years, which really isn't that many when you consider uh, these days, you know, car companies build, uh, you know- Two million Camrys, or you know, whatever I, you know, I don't know the numbers, but but seventy six thousand for that complete seventeen year span was uh, not that many cars, and of those cars, um, you know, a good portion of them were destroyed or scrapped. So you know, the numbers dwindle a little bit. I'd say we probably have, you know, forty to fifty thousand cars, you know, in total that are available throughout the world. You know, wow. Today. Now, as I walk through, you have about like 20 bodies here and stuff. Uh, how do you find these bodies? eBay, word of mouth, all that stuff? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I've got a pretty good social media reach. So, um, you know, I know a lot of people kind of out there. And, you know, every once in a while I'll post something on social media and say, hey, I'm looking for a car. But for the most part, I, um, you know, I hunt for them just like everybody else. Uh, you know, I've got alerts on Craigslist and I've got, you know, I'm checking eBay and I'm checking all the different, you know, companies. Plus I, I contact everybody that's a dealer of these cars and, you know, let them know, look, I'm always a buyer. Um, and, uh, you know, whenever I get a lead, I chase it. You know, I just picked up a car or two cars in New Mexico. I picked up a, a barn find in Oregon. Um, got one in Texas this last summer. So just really anywhere that, that I find that there's a car. Have you found any that were mint? I found a couple of cars, you know, over the years that are, you know, what you call like, um, you know, survivor cars that are just like, you know, as they left the factory, maybe just a little bit of wear and patina. And, you know, that's really right now the trend. That's what everybody wants. They want a car that hasn't been restored, that hasn't been abused, low mileage, yep. uh, survivor Barn car. Barn find, right. Um, and, and the numbers are, you know, very few now. Yeah. Um, it always it, blows my mind in this, in this world of Internet that... Uh, that there's still something out there. Like I watch those shows on Discovery and stuff, and the guy will open a garage, and the guy has like a Lamborghini Countach, and you're like, what? Like, how does somebody not go like, yeah, man, uh, that's worth a lot of money, you know? Like, it's so crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, some of that stuff on TV ends up being a little bit staged, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. but you know, the the finds are still out there. You know, there 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 are some that are hiding and. And, uh, you know, when you do find it, man, there's no feeling like opening that barn door, you know, or sliding that door. And, and all of a sudden, you know, you, you see something that's just been sitting, um, you know, real quick. Uh, this happened to me just uh, about four months ago. I had a tip that there was a, a 55 356 coupe in Compton. And, um, you know, a guy named uh, Carlos you know, said, I need to talk to Juan. And then Juan uh, led me to another guy, David. And before you know it, uh, I was in the middle of Compton with my truck and trailer uh, digging out a 55 356 in an airplane hangar that had been there for 
heck, uh, 30 years. I, you know what's great about those? Not so much finding them, but the story of them. Because it's always some kind of crazy story. Like, I just recently did comedy. I'm a comedian. And uh, you know, I did it at the Fox Theater in Oakland. And they just shut the doors for like 38 years. And then eight years ago, reopened it. And, and that's a lot of like what happens with these cars. It's a guy's car. Like you always hear the one. Well, it was my husband's. He went off to war and he didn't make it back. So I just kept it in the garage the whole time. And you're like, wow. Yeah. You know. Well, that's that's kind of like the story with this car. I mean, it. Uh, I can kind of put the pieces together how it ended up there because the original engine was with the car and it was out and it had a blown motor on, you know, the couple of pistons were off of it. And then there was a fresh rebuilt engine that was ready to go in the car, but wasn't installed right next to it, right next to it. And then there was a, the car had been repainted with like some really crappy, you know, silver paint job where they oversprayed on the window seals and door seals and all that. So, you know, the, the best way that I can put the story together is that the guy blew the engine and, you know, decided to repaint it and rebuild an engine. But unfortunately, before he got it put back together, he passed away. Wow. And uh, the car had been sitting for almost 30 years, just like that. So all the boxes of parts were there. Did you get all that stuff Everything. Too? Got wow. every part. So wow. um, when we go back out to the shop, I'll show you the car. And, did the uh, guy know what he had or did he? Um, yeah, they knew. They, You know, it was um, the guy that I got it from had bought it from the uh, the widow. Oh, so, gotcha. So it was. Um, he you was know, flipping. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, it, so, you know, he knew what it was and. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not out there trying to steal the cars. Um, you yeah. know, uh, I, I'm always like upfront with somebody like, look, you know, um, if you've got a car, uh, you know, I'll give you X amount for it. You might be able to get another, you know, 5,000 bucks if you deal with eBay and all of that. But I'm always kind of a straight shooter because, you know, these days you can't, you can't, you know, blow smoke up somebody's ass. You got to be straight with them because it's yeah. too easy to find out. Totally. You know what? The sh- what what, it, what it it's actually you. worth? You know, yeah. um, you know, it's easy to get on there and and get on eBay or get on you know some auction site or or whatever and see yeah, what these cars are actually selling for, right? So I'm just always like, I it's best for me to just be a sh- straight shooter, and I've always been that way. But um, but yeah, I'll show you the car, man. It's pretty it's pretty awesome. So we're actually installing the engine tomorrow. The original one, the the, the one that goes in it. Yeah, no, the one that he had rebuilt. Oh. Um, the original one is is being re- we're rebuilding that right now, but we're. We're going to put the engine in that he had rebuilt to put in it. You don't want um, the numbers matching? Uh, eventually, we'll put the number. We'll, we'll, re- we'll restore and rebuild the numbers matching one and put it aside. But the numbers matching engine on a 55 only has about 45 horsepower. Oh. And uh, the other one that he had built uh, was actually a 912 engine. Which is going to have about uh, ninety horsepower. So you know, I'm a horsepower guy. So. Ninety. Yeah. So uh, I know it doesn't sound like much. <laughs> Forty five. Uh, yeah, but uh, it's twice what uh, the, the original. original. One. Let's get into this a little bit because um, these cars uh, they had no horsepower when they started out. Of course, they're known for massive horsepower now and handling and racing. Uh, what got you into these cars? Because uh, I know your great grandfather and then your your dad, right? Or your grandfather, your dad, and all those guys were into it. But it's not a fast car, and it's uh, it's not as hot as like a nine eleven. What gets you into this uh, model? Well, when I was fourteen years old, I did my first restoration on a three fifty six, and and I built 14? it fourteen when I was fourteen. Well, yeah. like, like because of your grandfather? Well. I- yeah, I mean, kind of my history. My, uh, you know, my grandfather was a customizer and and taught me how to, you know, weld when I was eight years old. And wow. by the time I was twelve years old, I was a um, a right side engine mechanic uh, on a top fuel dragster. So for for three years, I traveled around the United States um, rebuilding. It was a nostalgia top fuel dragster, so it was a front engine, um, oh, wow. you know, iron block Hemi. And oh. uh, so when I was that's that's what I grew up doing. And so. Um, so yeah, for three years, 12, 13, 14 years old, I was, uh, a mechanic rebuilding engines and then, uh, saved up my money and bought a 53 coupe when I was 14 and started the restoration on it. And but why that car? Cause they're slow and stuff. Since you're working in the dragster world, you're not, a, you're because not- my dad was selling parts for Porsches oh, and oh, my, cause gra- he would grab all those parts from where he used to work. Right. Like- well, yeah. So, so I was just around them, you know, I, I've been around these little Porsches my whole life yeah. and, and I love them. And you know, there's, there's nothing like the unique shape of a, of a 356. But what happened was, you know, yeah, you say they're slow. Um, but it's all relative, you know, that they don't weigh anything either, yeah. you know, and they're extremely aerodynamic. So 
what to some 90 or 100 horsepower doesn't seem like much. But you know what? I can drive circles around people with twice the horsepower because they're is in a big... Right? Oh, man. They're just amazing little cars. So what I did is I built this car when I was 14, finished it when I was 16, and went vintage racing in it and was racing all over. And um, that's really what started my business 27 years ago was I had some people that came up to me. They're like, Rod, man, you're so fast in this little 356 and having such a good time. Would you build a car for me and teach me how to go racing? And, you know, that really kind of started my business. And, and I just continued to evolve the the 356 itself now the cars that i'm building today in the shop you know run 911 suspension and yeah. i take a 911 engine and shrink it down and and uh, make it a four cylinder and and uh you know give these cars 200 or 250 horsepower wow which is crazy when you you know you're thinking about a car that was originally only had 45 to 90 horsepower yeah. you know yeah. so the fun part for me is that the cars we're building today um, you know, the power to weight ratio is incredible. You know, when you've got a car that weighs 1,950 or 2,000 pounds and it's got 200 to 250 horsepower, that power to weight ratio is as good as, you know, some of the, you know, uh, you know, a Corvette or, uh, you wow. know, a newer, newer Porsche. And, and so you, you can really have some fun in them. And then we put disc brakes on them, even though it looks like it's got drum brakes. Um, you know, we've got disc brakes that are hidden behind the aluminum wheels that used to be steel. And yeah. So we lighten everything up and we make it faster. We make it shift better. And these guys just have a blast, you know, driving That's these insane. things. That's insane. Now, these cars, did they all come silver or cream? Was that the only colors? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, everybody always asks, you know, Rod, all your, you know, a lot of the cars you build are kind of, you know, the kind of basic colors. They, they actually came in um, most... Uh, years the cars had you know 12 or 15 colors available is that you know? right I, it seems like i only see silver cream and an occasional black yeah so for example like in 1956 you had uh you know an aquamarine blue metallic and you had uh a couple of different reds and then you had yellow and you had you know black and you had silver and then you know as they got later into the years you had um champagne yellow or um uh, you know, there was even some special colors like orange, but those cars are very, you know, few that were out there. I mean, there's a fjord green, but what you, you typically see is the silver, the black, the white, the ivory. Um, those were the, the most common colors. Right. And, um, you know, and the cars that I'm building today, you know, I, I like things a little more, even though my cars are radically changed, I like to make everything subtle. So, you know, I'm not the guy that's going to, you know, have an engine compartment that has steel braided lines and a you know a, a big red dis, you know coil and an ignition box to get make it pop you know i mean yep. for me it's all about making everything look subtle making everything kind of flow together and um you know i even do that with colors i mean like i'm building a a, a speed yellow 356 right now that'll be a real bright yellow and i've done some yellow ones uh, but most of the cars that I'm building are a little more, a little more, you know, earthy tones or subtle colors. And, right, right. You know. I always love that ivory. You know, yeah. man, that was the shit. The, just the way it looked and the patina on it and stuff. You know. Yeah. Now, what about the interior? Do you do you do keep the interior? Kind of looked stock to me. I was looking at them out there. Uh, do you do you do up the interiors or is it just stock and re refurbished? Yeah. So. You know, obviously, I want to make these cars drive better, handle better, but I still want them to feel, smell, and look like a, an original 356, or yeah. at least have the characteristics. So I don't do you know crazy you know uh, custom looking interiors with you know diamond you know patterns, and yeah, it's just yeah. it just doesn't fit these cars. You know, there's a lot that goes into making the interiors nicer than they ever were. I mean, you know, everything from the insulation to the carpet. You know, we do extra insulation to make er, and and sound deadening, and then the you you know, the foam that we use in the seats is, you know, is a special foam instead of the old horsehair. And, you know, so we, we've improved a lot of those areas. That horsehair is what gave it the smell, the, which I never knew. I went to the factory yep. uh, about 10 years ago. And every car you sit in forever, even the VW. It has that smell. All has that same smell. Yeah. And it just reminds me of like fourth grade. My mom had a VW, you know? Yeah, a VW and a, and a Porsche, an early Porsche smells like gasoline and horsehair, you exactly. know? Exactly. Yeah. 
It's crazy, man. Yeah. Like the smell of that interior. You, yeah. You could be blindfolded and someone could stick you in one of those rides. You go, oh, I'm in a VW. Yeah. You know? Well, and, the, and you know, the Porsches and Volkswagens shared those same kind of, yeah. you know, characteristics because yeah. of the, the materials. And we do actually still retain some horsehair in the car to, like I said earlier, you know, we still want them to feel and yeah. look and smell like a, you know, because that is, that's part of that experience because people buy these cars. There's no rational reason why they, you know, spend two, three, four hundred thousand dollars on a three fifty six. Is that, one, is that yeah. what it costs? Yeah. So like, you know, what's you know, the difference between a two hundred thousand and a four hundred thousand? Well, part of it's gonna depend on the car that we start with. If it's a coupe, yeah. you know, they're less expensive than a speedster or a roadster. Oh I got it. Uh, but also the stuff that we do to them. So like the cars that I can that I call three fifty six outlaws, my Emory Outlaws, uh, they don't have a they don't have a whole lot of body modifications. Totally restored, right. um, chassis stiffening, all the rust repair done. But the body is stock lines. But all, but everything underneath has been upgraded, so it's got more power and more, uh, you know, better handling, yeah. better performance. Those cars are about two hundred and fifty thousand. Um, the cars that I call an Emory Special, where I've modified all the lines, gotten rid of drip rails, raised wheel arches, you know, trimmed the bumpers in, that type of thing. Those cars are going to be more like three fifty to four hundred because there's another six months in metal work and wow. you know you know you change one thing and you got to change five more you know so it's it's um, uh, so that's why those cars are you know more expensive. But, but now uh, it, I'm looking at the uh, there's a blue one out here that looks like the James Dean ride. Yeah, uh, is that an original body? Yeah, so that's a that's a Speedster body. Right. Um, and every car that's in the shop is an original 356. I don't wow. have I don't have any replicas here. We wow. uh, wait. There's the Speedster and the Spider. They're the same ride, right? But one's for track. Is well, that... the, they look similar, right? To the untrained eye, they look similar. Or somebody that doesn't know the cars, you know, they they look similar. But the Speedster was built from 1954 to 1958. There was a, there were a couple of 59s that were Carreras, but 50, you know, 54 to 58, and they were steel body, right? Uh, rear engine, steel body. The Spider, uh, which was built in '54 and then carried on, you know, up into the '60s in different, you know, there was a 550, 550A, R, you know, RSK, RS60. There were a couple different uh, models, but the Spider itself is an aluminum body with a mid-engine. So oh, mid-engine, yeah. So, oh, so that's the desired one, yeah. Right? So the spi- aluminum body, and that's why they're three to five million dollars. Whoa. That's so, what they call. How many of those you think are are well uh, that are still around? Yeah. Um, you know, there were about 100 spiders built. Don't quote me on the numbers. I don't, you know, but there were yeah. about 100 spiders built, you know, and then well, you know, I don't know what the total number of spiders are. I, I probably should know, but I got you. But, but yeah, they're very low numbers, right? right? Um, so like in the 550s, I think there was I think there were 100 of them. Um, and you know, most of them have been accounted for. Yeah. Um, you know, James Dean's car is still floating around, you know, probably hidden in someone's barn or something, but Wow, that thing said so that well, that thing was pretty uh mutilated, right? It was. The and then it went on like this traveling uh display yeah. and then I think it was on a train and then it disappeared. Wow, someone so, stole it? Yeah, somebody stole it, somebody hid the thing. It's uh yeah, that I, I you know, who knows. That's you know, incredible. There's some there's some uh you know uh, there's some people that say they've they've located it. Who knows? You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Whatever. that bullet Mustang recently. Yeah. Turns out it was real. Right. You know, it's insane. I mean, to me, it it really is the James Dean folklore. You know, that was it. You know, you see the photos of him. He's out. You know, burning around. You know, Bakersfield and Barstow and yep. all that in that car. That's that whole thing to me, you know. And it really gets my gears going on it back in the day. And then uh, I always tell a story of my sixth grade teacher had a, a 911 Targa, root beer brown, right? And my buddy Jimmy Barchi had road and track. And I really get get into it. And 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 recently I'm way back into it because I'm like I got to get in now because it's going to be too late. You know, not going to yeah. be able to buy anything. Yeah, it's crazy. The the, you know, these cars have gotten so expensive now. Unfortunately, that 
it's hard to break into it, you know, um, which is, you know, now you've seen the rise in values on the 911s yep. and, and it drug the 912s with it. So, you know, a 912, we used to buy those cars for four or 5,000 bucks. Yeah. You know, now they're 30 or 40,000 to and find a decent one. a 911, but with a, a VW motor, right? Well, it's a, it's a 911 with a 356 motor. Oh, so, so it's got that old 40 horsepower motor? Well, no, it's got a 90 horsepower. I got it. 95 horsepower engine. Uh, it's it basically, it, they started building the 912 right after they stopped building the 356s. Gotcha. So they took the the latest 356 engine, the the you know the right. end one, and they made a few changes to it, and then they made it so that it would mount up into a 912. Because a, a 356 engine and transmission as a unit mounts from the front of the transmission to the center between the engine and transmission, okay? And then a 911 or a 912 mounts up at the front of the transmission and at the back of the engine. So they had to make a few minor modifications to the engine so that they could hang the thing in a different configuration. But it, the, the engine, all the components, parts are just like the latest 356 engine. Now, do you think that the 912, like a lot of people now are starting to go like, well, the 912 is the one because it's lighter and, and uh, you think that's just because people can't afford a 911 so they're getting onto that 912? Well, I, you know, I mean, there's going to be a little bit of that, but uh, you know, the 912 does handle better than a 911 because it is weight balance is a little bit better. It's lighter, less weight hanging off the back of it. Um, you know, I've, I've built, uh, three 912 vintage race cars and they'll hang with a, an early 911 because of that weight balance and, and, you know, weight advantage. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, you're going to find certain people that'll be like, oh yeah, I'd much rather have a 912 because it's lighter, but the, the reality is, is it's yeah. it's a hundred thousand dollars cheaper. So you know, <laughs> that's it's probably that guy that's saying it. Yeah, right? yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, uh, those things I didn't even know they existed till a year ago. My buddy's like, "Here's one." I'm like, "What's a nine twelve? It's way cheaper." And then I read, "Oh, super small motor. It yeah. was made for like moms that wanted the look or whatever, you know." But yeah, but they're bitching cars. Uh, you know, I'm I've had I've had probably ten nine twelves over the years. Is everything and, the same in the nine twelve except the motor and stuff like the interior? And the dials. The, the, the interior is the same. Um, there's uh, there aren't as many gauges because there's no oil level gauge. Right. But but the dash, everything's the same. Uh, the seats are the same. Windows are all the same. You know, it doesn't take much to turn a nine twelve into a nine eleven. Um, you know, I mean, it's not going to have that chassis number. But um, I've done five cars over the years where I've taken a nice nine twelve and changed the engine mounts and put a, a 911 engine in it then the only thing you got to really do is add an oil tank um to, to turn a 912 into a 911 you you change the engine mounts install the engine add an oil tank because a 911 engine's uh, dry sump instead of wet sump and then you got to change the tack because the tack on a 912 is for a four cylinder oh, wow and uh, a 911 is a six cylinder so that's about all you got to do to turn a 912 into a 911 right? yeah then you got a daily daily driver yeah uh, not as valuable you know yeah it's going to be you know it's not going to be less valuable than a 912 it's not going to be as valuable as a 911 but it's going to give you that 911 drivability but you know you're talking to a guy that's not afraid to cut and and uh, modify 356s and 911s yeah. so you know there's always those purists out there that are don't do it but you know what those guys can uh, those guys can have their thing and they can spend just as much money and uh, twice the time and build a car that they can't drive because they're afraid to get it dirty. I'll uh, that, yeah, that shit's scary, right? Like, yeah. I mean, it, it, that's that's awesome that you say that because you, you do cut into the rides and and a lot of people say that you are the first the outlaw Porsche guy, right? You know what I mean? I mean, there's other guys out there that are kind of known for it, like Magnus Walker, guys like that. But you are really the guy that started it, right? Well, so. Porsche Porsches have always been modified. You know, everybody's right. always taken a Porsche and you know um, lowered it and turned it into a race car and done things like that. Um, and you know, so so I'm I'm not the first guy to modify a Porsche. Right. But what happened was when I was 14 years old, my dad and I, my dad has Porsche parts shop in Costa Mesa. You know, I'm back there drilling holes and putting fog lights on cars and putting hood straps on cars and having fun. You know, getting rid of the hubcaps and polishing the drums and lowering them and painting the wheels a different color. Um, I was doing that back in a time in in the late 80s when uh, the full Concours movement was at full force. You know, everybody was worried about, you know, the, the name on the bolt and the direction of, of the head and, you know, lint in their air cleaners. And, and I was wanting a car that I could go out and drive and race the shit out of and have fun. 
And uh, so what happened was a friend of our, well, a bunch of guys would come to my dad's shop that are Concord guys and buying parts, and they'd be like, oh, man, you guys are outlaws. <sighs> You know, because we were we weren't playing by the rules. Yeah, we yeah. were we were doing our own thing, and we didn't give we didn't care. You know, because yeah. we were building cars the way that we wanted. And so, um, a buddy of mine that's a jeweler made a badge for like this badge for us that said three fifty six outlaws, and it was just something that we put on you know the car, and then it just became a thing. You know, uh, so for years there weren't classes at the you know, events that were, you know, uh, uh, for modified cars. Yeah, they didn't even want you in there, they right? They didn't even want us in there. And and what happened was, you know, then later on... You guys were the par- designated the parking lot? We, we were out in the dirt parking lot because there wasn't a class for us. That's and, hilarious. And, Get out there, road warrior, yeah. you dirt bags. So, so it just kind of caught on. And, and, you know, they so then we started giving away that badge to a few of our friends that had cars that were kind of hot rotted out or, you know, in the spirit of what we were doing. And, yep. and uh, you know, now the term... Outlaw is pretty loosely used for anything modified Porsche, uh, but it really the as that term outlaw is associated with Porsche uh, originated in Costa Mesa when uh, uh, all of our buddies were calling us outlaws and we made that badge in in the eighties. That's so cool, man! Yeah. It's it, like just to think about back then when you were working on that car is worth probably like you know three grand, like, yeah, <laughs> three grand, you know. And now here we're talking four hundred thousand over here. Uh, I walked through your your shop here, and it's uh, pretty amazing. It totally, I told you this when I came in, reminded me of the early days of West Coast Choppers. You know, you got the kids out there that are welding. They got radio head on in there. Yep, I was like, yep. yeah. Is, <laughs> I mean, West Coast wouldn't have radio head on. But you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's young people working with their hands, which is absolutely amazing to see. I don't think there's a guy out there over 35, is there? No, you know, I mean... I am. Yeah, I'm, I I'm 43, that. but yeah. but you know, I started when I was eight, ten years old, and and because there were people around me that um, you know gave me a chance and taught me to you know some skills, and and uh, that's something that I've always kind of you know paid forward is is to bring guys that have passion and desire, teach them the skills, and and uh, put them to work, and and so they are. They're all younger guys. I mean, I've got you know a few guys that have been with me 20 years. Wow. Um, you know, uh, but. You know, I'd say half the guys on the floor, you know, they've been here, you know, two, three years and they're, you know, in their early to mid 20s and they're just eager to come come to work. I mean, we start early. I'm here at 4 a.m. every day. 4 a.m.? Uh, my guys all show up between 5 and 6. Are you kidding and we me? Just, we start banging away, man. Um, they, they love what they do. Yeah. Uh, they love the environment. You know, we have a lot of fun. Uh, plus they got health care? They're all taken care of. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, so so the, these guys are great. I mean, they're really good guys. Yeah. and. And, um, you know, we break at two thirty or three o'clock and that way we can go up in the hills and drive and miss traffic, do whatever we want to do. But we put in the hours early and yeah. uh, just a good group of guys, you know, give me the rundown. So a guy comes in, he says, uh, Hey, I'm Brad Pitt. I want to get one of your cars. Yeah. I mean, that's the type of guy that's going to be coming in, you know, Yeah, a Jay Leno, whatever. Um, they come in, they sit down and what do they do? They discuss the color the motor size and the body shape f- with you first, or or is it just like I want a three fifty six? I'll see you in two years. How does it go down? Yeah, I mean it's uh, typically the, the the people that come to me have some interest in Porsche. Most of them have you know an early three fifty six, and maybe they've got a new nine nine seven in their garage. You know, so they and and they're like you know Rod, I'd love something that I can drive every day. That's the best of both worlds. Looks like my old car, but drives like my new one. And yep. and so once I. So when they come and, and we start talking about it, the first thing I want to find out is how they're going to use the car. You know, are they going to daily drive it? Are they going to just use it to bomb up to Willow Springs and want to do some track time in it? You know, are they going to take it on, you know, cross-country road trips? Because then it helps me kind of understand the type of car I want to build for them. And then um, I determine what model style they like, you know, whether it's a convertible or a coupe. And then whether it's an early 356 or they like the later, you know, C-coupes. Um, and then I find out the color ranges they like. Yeah. And then from there, I, I put a plan together. Um, I'm pretty particular about how the cars need to look in the end. Um, and 
and I'm, you know, basically when I put an, an outline or a package together, it's like, look, here it is. You got a couple of options, you know. Do you want air conditioning or no air conditioning? Wow. Uh, you know, and they can get uh, AC. Huh? They can get AC in them. Yeah. Um, but we Nobody hide it. Nobody gets that, we, right? Oh uh, yeah. There's a couple. Okay. Of, you know, there's people that live in Vegas that want to oh, drive yeah. their cars. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, or and then, but as far as like. All Power the stuff. steering? Um, yeah, there's, we've got two cars that we're doing right now that are all nine, nine they're all nine sixty four running gear. So, wow. so we can run power steering and coilovers and all that stuff. But uh, so yeah, I I do figure out a couple of things, but for the most part, I'm ninety nine percent of the input on how the car is going to look. Uh, they can they can choose the the final tone of the color maybe or something. But but yeah, so then once we determine what the car is going to look like and what the budget is, then I go and find a donor car, a car that you know fits the bill. And then I have them purchase the car. Yeah. And then we. Oh, you got to go do that. There's not like some bodies here ready to like. Uh, All these cars that you see in the shop, paid for? They, they already have an owner. Wow. Yep. No uh, shit. So, but what I do is I go and find the appropriate car for what the What are you going to do when you run out of the bodies? I will, we'll never run out. Really? I mean, no, nah, because there's so many cars out there that need to be restored that, you know, uh, it, it's just going to continue to get more expensive. Right, yeah. Oh, my God. You know? Yeah, you million know? dollar, three fifty. Well, whatever, cents. you know. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. yeah, but we won't run out. Um, yeah. uh, there's plenty of, of cars that were restored 30 or 40 years ago that still, they need to be restored again, you know. Yep. Um, so, yeah, once we determine what it is and I, I find a donor car and have them purchase it, then we have a waiting list right now of about 12 months, so we can't start building it for about 12 months. Wow. Uh, and then it takes 12 months to build the car, so, two you know, years. two years. Yeah. Wow. And that's and just- Do you get guys just calling you like, hey, what's going on with my car? <laughs> well, there's always going to be, there's always going to be people, um, you know, that want it faster than we, you know, than, than we can deliver, but I, I stay, you know, informed with my customers. I, I let them know, you know, how the project's yeah. progressing and- and, um, you know, sometimes we run into, into some type of delay and I have to tell them, hey, it's going to be a couple more months or whatever. But for the most part, we try to stay on track as much as we can. What about this one? A guy comes in and goes, hey, uh, I want one today. Can you call all your customers and see if they want to sell it to me? You ever done that? Uh, but he would be on the back of about a 25 person list. Wow. Because I've got about 20, 25 people that are like, hey, if a car comes up, let me know. No and shit. And I'll buy it. So, wow. so because of that, this is not a place for an instant gratification guy. Yeah. It, you know, if you don't have patience, if you don't, you know, I mean, I tell people, look, um, you know, we cost more and we take longer, but that's just part of the deal. You know, <laughs> if, if you, if, if you don't have the patience for it, there's plenty of other shops that'll build cars for you or there's, you know, there's some out there, it, you know, for me, it's, it's finding somebody that wants the, wants a car that's special built just for them. That's going to have all the you know, power and performance and, you know, little tricks that we can put in it. Yeah. And um, you know how it is. Just yeah, yeah. sometimes you got to wait for it. Now, are your cars at the concourse now, like up at uh, Half Moon Bay and all that? You well, so I've never entered a concourse in my entire life until yeah. this last August. Yeah? So I've been an anti concourse guy my entire life. Is that right? Just because, well, when I was a kid, you know, yeah. I got I, there was no place for me. Um, and, you know, it just wasn't my scene. But I just finished a, a multi-year restoration on Porsche's first race car and the first Porsche to ever win the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Now, so how the, did that go down? Did they ask you to do it or did somebody own it? Um, one of my clients, uh, we sourced the car, found it. And uh, did the research and restored the car, and um, so it was a multi-year project. Wow! And, but it's Porsche's very first race car, the very first Porsche to ever win the 24 Hours of Le Mans. And so when the car was done, um, we felt that it was appropriate for it to be debuted in its finished state at Pebble Beach. Wow! For a couple of reasons. One, it's a good platform to you know let everybody see it. But also, when that car came to the United States in 1952, Pebble Beach. Road races was the first place that car raced on U.S. soil. Wow! So it was pretty cool to bring it back to uh, where it it first started here. But that was a car that took a few years to build or to restore. And um, did you uh, have photos of it, like uh, uh, intense photos, where you can see what it originally was? Yeah, I mean we had a we had a ton of photos that uh, we found at the uh, Porsche archives and um, you know stuff that we had we had dug up. So what's that I can't car get worth? 
uh, you know, I yeah, I, I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna say, but uh, I can't go into too much detail on that car just because uh, um, there's a documentary that's oh. just wrapping on the car. Oh and, no, shit, and, uh, huh? So there's there's a, a really great team, Ren Films, that did a, a multi year documentary as we were doing the whole thing. So uh, I'll make sure to let you guys and your viewers know when that oh is my out God, and available. That'd be amazing. You know what it's called or anything? Um, no, not at the. Uh, yeah, I can't release the oh, the, got, the yeah. name at the moment, but but yeah, so it's a it's a really great film uh we previewed part of it here uh about three weeks ago and uh about a hundred people came to the shop that were involved in the restoration people that we had we had actually it was 84 people but uh that had come to the shop to just see the car in its finished state and uh also see this you know preview this documentary so that'll be really cool wow yeah i i look at the bodies out there and i think the thing that just absolutely floors me the most is uh, you know, rust is the ultimate demon for a car. Uh, everybody, you know, I had a, a, a 69 Roadrunner. You could put your feet through the floor, you know. And it blows my mind when I look at those bodies out there after the metal work is done. They look like a brand new body, you know. Yeah, yeah and that's the plan, you know. I mean, we, we, uh, we spend about six months on each body getting every line and every panel, you know, repaired so repairing the rust reinforcing it all and then metal finishing it as close as we can so that we can you know do minimal amount of body work on the car uh because they're a unibody car which means the fenders and um you know the front and rear fenders don't unbolt off the car oh they don't no it's all integrated in in one piece so the only thing that comes off the car is the hood deck lid and doors but wow yeah so that stuff's all hand formed back in the day yep it, originally it was stamped and then it was all welded together um and now what we do is we repair panels or we have to make a nose panel or a tail panel and and uh you know weld that back into the car but Where it's do you all make one that, piece. right in here we do yeah so you know our shop's loaded with equipment i mean the reason you said it kind of felt like uh, old west coast chopper days is you know, Jesse had a you know a great arsenal of tools. I mean, yep. you know, big power hammers and pull maxes and all, all that stuff. All the rollers and everything. Yep. Yep. And and that's all the same stuff that that I've got here. You know, I've got two pull maxes. I've got a an Eckled uh, power hammer. I've got you know four planishing hammers, an English wheel, uh, bead rollers. You know, all that stuff. And it's all old school equipment. You know, it's stuff that was that was used back in the fifties and sixties. And and uh, you know, really a lot of it is the same type of equipment they used. You know, back in the day when we were, when they were building these cars. Wow, man, that's that's insane. Now, uh, let's let's get a little bit into this here. The how much do you actually work on the cars now? Because I know this is a you're 27 years in. This is a full blown business. And 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 before I go any further, I know I'm going to get people that'd be like four hundred thousand for a fucking car. Oh, fuck that or whatever. A lot of people, and they used to say that about Jesse too. The <clears throat> bikes are 150. The man hours, yeah, the man hours on these cars is just unbelievable. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, how are you going to put a price on it? Because no matter what you think, you're still going like, God, I'm kind of losing here. You're not losing, but you're not getting rich. You know what right. I'm saying? Like, yeah. So, how much do you work on the cars yourself? Now? So, yeah, the way that I organize my shop is that. Um, you know, my station is kind of right in the middle. Yeah. Um, so if you, you know, we've got cars down both sides and I'm, you know, in the middle of the shop so that I can be, you know, I'm kind of like the, the lead singer in a rock band, you know, yeah. because, you know, I'm, I'm the, I'm the guy that's out front that has to talk to everybody, but I'm also the one that's kind of leading everybody and, and, and everybody in the shop, um, you know, has their specialty. I've got, uh, you know, Jake and Sal that are doing the, the rust repair, uh, and then, you know, I've got Justin that's doing a lot of the technical fabrication, building roll bars, that kind of stuff. Uh, Tanner and I are doing the, uh, the bulk of the metal shaping and building panels. Uh, and then the other guys in the assembly area, Joe and Robert and Luke and Chris, you know, those guys are doing more of the, the, the assembly and, and design stuff. But I'm in the shop. Um, the reason I get here at 4 a.m., I run the business, you know, and, and kind of make the decisions. But the reason I get here at 4 a.m. is so that I can knock out whatever stuff I got to do in the office and get to work. So when my guys show up in the morning, I'm already working. Sparks are flying. Shit's going crazy. 4 a.m. What time do so, you go to bed? Uh, usually about 11. So I'm a, I'm a four or five hour a night sleeper. I have been since I was about six years old. So, wow. Uh, but so I'm in the shop. I, I like to be already, you know, full throttle when everybody shows up and they just kind of follow my lead and these guys pound away. And then I work till, you know, three, four o'clock in the afternoon 
kind of start to taper it down and then, uh, you know, go, uh, go spin bicycles with my wife and hang out with my kids and go drive cars up in the hills and then, uh, grab some food and go to sleep and, and do it all over again. But I spend personally about eight to 10 hours a day physically working on the cars. The only time I break from doing that is when I'm hanging out with guys like you and, uh, sharing, you know, some information on a, a podcast or a video. I've got some guys from Petrolicious here tomorrow doing some stuff on one of the cars and, and, uh, so uh, but my my love is is fabricating and building cars and and so it's I've, that stuff. That's the that's, that's what that's what drives right. me, man. That's what I love. You still uh, which one? Do you own one yourself now, or do you just sell them? Oh no, I I own too many of them. You uh, do. After we're done, I'll take you over to my other building and show you some of the finished cars. But you know, I've got a '64 Cabriolet that was my first Emory Special. I've got a 55 coupe that's all hot rotted out with 200 horsepower. You have your very first one still? Uh, I don't. Uh, my very first car I finished when I was 16 and raced it for 20 years. And then in 2010, um, uh, one of my best friends had lost his leg in a motorcycle accident. And uh, my wife and I in 2002 made it our mission to um, raise as much money as we could for people that had lost limbs. And and uh, we started, we linked up with this charity Limbs for Life Foundation wow. that, that puts limbs on people that um, that don't have insurance. And and so from 2002 to 2007 or eight, we had a race team that we were um, raising money at all the races and and doing stuff. And and we put uh, you know 30 or 40 limbs on people throughout that process. And then at, in 2009, the director, the executive director of the foundation, said, "Hey Rod, you got any ideas to help us? You know, raise some awareness." I said, "Well." I said, how about if I donate my first race car to you? I said, this thing's treated me, you know, like a king for 20 years. I said, I'll donate it to charity. You know, at the time, it wasn't worth much. I mean, yeah. even, I mean, back in 2009, the cars weren't worth half what they are today, you Isn't know? Isn't crazy? We're talking 2000 now. We're at 17 right now. It's like, it, to put your money into vintage guitars, right. Rolexes. And uh, and it's crazy. Nine Elevens, man. I know. So and I, that way, at least you have something you enjoy. It's insane how, how, how much the, 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 the values have gone up. But yeah. you know, so I donated my my first race car, uh, my first car that I had built, um, and it was still exactly as I built it. You know, because I always kept it up just like it was. And we donated it, and then the charity um, uh, decided to raffle it off, and we sold a hundred and eighty or eight no eighteen hundred. Hundred dollar tickets. We raised one hundred eighty thousand right. uh, dollars, and then uh, in February of two thousand ten, the charity uh, had a big dinner function. Pulled a ticket out, and uh, I delivered that car to a guy in Texas that that Whoa. won the car for a hundred bucks. Whoa! So he man. he kept it for a couple of years, <laughs> and then um, and then he sold it to another guy that lives up in New Hampshire. Uh huh. And I've uh, I was put into contact with the guy in New Hampshire about two years later. And uh, I was just reunited with the car for the first time. From when I delivered it in 2010, I hadn't seen it until uh, um, April of last year. I was in New York City for doing a kind of a media thing with Fox News and some other stuff. And uh, the guy in New Hampshire that had my car, I, I called him up and I said, hey, I said, is there any way I can come and see my old car? And he goes, well, why don't you just come take it? So if you get on my Instagram and go back about you know, a year, you'll see me bombing through the streets of downtown New York City. Whoa, Manhattan for, just for, rocking For it? a week. Wow. Yeah, you'll see New York Times. In, and so I spent, I, I put 1,200 miles on the car in a week. Wow. In New York City and then up in uh, the Palisades and all those areas and just had the time of my life. Um, so I don't have it anymore. Yeah. Because it, it changed lives. I mean, that car was uh, responsible for putting about you know fifty people back on their feet that That's had lost so limbs. Cool man. Uh, but the guy that owns it is super cool and and uh, is he like a rock star or, or? Nope. He's just a he's just a, a simple guy that that uh, loves cars and and bought it and um, drive you know he drives it on the streets in in New Hampshire and and just fell in love with a car that I built and bought it. And, wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, it, now, I want to ask you something here, if you can answer me this. I don't know how much you know about 964s or 993s. Are, are you into those cars at all? You know, I'm, yeah, I mean, I've, you know, I've had both 964s and 993s and love the cars. I, you know, I, I'm very familiar with the, the components because, yep. you know, the engine that we use in our 356s is, is two thirds of a 964. So it's all 964 components. And one of the cars that we were just finishing up right now is a 356 with all 964 running gear, you know, under it. And uh, I've done a bunch of work with the guys over at Singer and, you know, and yep. they use 964 as their platform. 
Um, so I love the cars. You know, the problem is, is that just like everything, the values are going up. And yeah. because those were the last two models of the air-cooled Porsches, right. the values are just screaming on them. Um, you know, uh, because Singer, uh, you know, when Rob decided to use the 964 as his platform for his car, that added more credibility to the, the 964. And, uh, and there weren't very many of them built. Yeah, so the no, values of those cars, uh, yeah, they're you know it, it's it, they're seventy five grand now. You know if you can find one. Well, it, it, it's always the wrong thing. It's like oh, it's a cabriolet, or oh man, it's a it's a a four. Everybody wants a two, a C two coupe. You know with right. manual. So oh no, it's automatic. You know whatever. Even with the it's it's almost impossible to find a good one these days. You know, and the nine nine threes, um, you know. I like 993s, but I, you know, if I had to choose between a 993 and the 964, I prefer a 964 because it's a little more traditional looking. Right. Um, but uh, both cars are brilliant, you know. I was just getting into the 993 because they say it handles way better. You yeah. know what I mean? It's got a different rear suspension. Right. You know, all the rear suspension is, uh, you know, it's a multi-link instead of the trailing arm. And so it doesn't like, uh, you know, have that uh, death back, you yeah. know. Around they're they're a great car. They're just they just have a little different line to them than uh, you know the the nine sixty four is like the very last of the traditional look look yeah you know um, and I'm kind of an old school guy but uh, but you can you can still find some nine nine threes every once in a while for a for a decent you know decent price but it's yeah it's crazy they're all everything's it is crazy. Uh, I, I saw that you used to race uh, ATCs. Yeah. Speaking of uh, losing limbs, man, I, I used to uh, rock those uh, religiously myself. And if you put your foot down, it ran over your foot. You remember that? I mean, oh, they, yeah. they yeah. made them illegal. It was crazy. But remember that? Like, And you would always put your foot down because that's what your head says Your instinct, do. yeah. Yeah. So you put your foot down and you'd run your own foot over and it'd break your foot or you could rip your foot off or anything, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, when I was 10 years old, well, I grew up in Tribuco Canyon, which is a, a little uh, dirt road canyon back behind, uh, in Orange County, back behind Mission Viejo. And so it was all dirt roads and hills and tracks and, you know, so I started riding three wheelers, ATCs when I was, you know, six, seven years old. And by the time I was 10, I was racing one and I raced this, uh, 150 mile team race at Paris raceway. And, and, uh, then that kind of, that was my first race when I was 10 and I'm like, man, I'm, I'm just into it, you know? And then I, I, then I moved up to a 350X ATC and then a 250R. And then, but in 1990 or 1986, when the four tracks, 250R four wheeler came out, you know, I immediately transition to that yeah and i raced those uh for about five years um kind of making my way all the way through the the ranks i um you know when i quit racing them you know i was at a pro level and um you know had a couple of local championships here in southern california and then raced the mickey thompson off-road series uh raced the nationals even raced uh, a four-wheeler in hawaii at the super bowl of motocross wow you know? so yeah i was living the dream as a 16 year old you know yeah yeah and you're welding you're working on uh, dragsters yeah. and you're racing you're straight california in any bmx in there like uh, well uh, bmx at, at the the bmx track in orange that was uh oh, yeah. i was riding bmx at six seven what eight were years you old um i had a gt, GT? Um, yeah, because gary turner you know gt bicycles yep. was a drag racer and uh, that was his passion. Yeah. And so Tom Topping, who was the owner of the Top Fuel Dragster that I raced, Tom was you know really good friends with Gary. And uh, so I, I raced a GT. I had a GT. Um, I also had a Mongoose. And yeah, um, you know, um, I mean, you get Southern California is the the absolute ground zero of BMX. You know, yeah. you got GJS, you got Stu Thompson, you got PK Rippers, you got everything. Cook Brothers, Redline. Yeah. All of the best BMX stuff right here in Southern California, man. It's unbelievable to think about. And that really goes back into handmade. You know, when you think about these guys, it was their dads that made these frames. These bikes, yeah. Yeah, because these Schwins that you modified broke, so they started yep. making these frames. And they don't have any geometry skills are but they made some of the best bmx frames on the planet yeah i had a cooks brothers the best uh, when i was when Santa i was Anna. when i was eight or nine years old yep. you know and uh and then my my closest friend growing up jason who was the rights or the uh, he was the left side mechanic 
well, half the time I was left, he was right. Um, but he uh, he got a Racing Incorporated. Do you, do you oh, remember Oh, yeah, Race Inc., yeah. Oh, which was also God. FMF. Uh, aluminum. Yeah. It was an aluminum frame, and I can remember. Remember you know, G-Boy? We're, we're like, uh, G-Boy was an early aluminum okay. frame with a big gusset. Then you go FMF, and then Race Inc. buys FMF, right. and it's the same yeah. exact thing. But the setup. Race Inc. was you know, the first aluminum bike that I had, you know, that I had access to, and so I was like, you know, here I'm I'm riding my uh, Cooks Brothers, I think, and Jason gets this race ink, and I'm like, oh man, you know, and I didn't have the cash to get one, and, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so we grew up, you know, racing bikes, and so you know, racing BMX, and then the next step for me was three wheelers, and and then four wheelers, and then I raced a little stadium car in the um, in the Mickey Thompson Off Road Series uh, for a couple of years, and um, man, just you know, yeah, living the dream. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, never was much of a surfer. I, you know, I, I'd go out there and surf a little bit, but um, I spent too much time in the dirt, full throttle, to be any good at surfing. But yeah, well, I mean, that's just like <laughs> on any Sunday, the the movies. You know what yeah. I mean? You're basically that. Uh, I saw on your Instagram you've uh, been going to some concerts. I had Joe Bonamassa on the uh, oh, podcast a few months. What an ago. amazing concert that was! Yeah, man. right. Uh, oh. Now, did you grow up on rock and roll, or did you hit late? Did you go to any shows early on? Because oh. uh, in 1984, I went to White Snake. You know, yeah. uh, uh, you know, always been a huge Aussie fan. It just as a kid, just uh, did you go uh, to the US Festival out there? No, yeah, um, you probably were too young because that was uh, 83. Yeah, no, I was. You know, my concert scene kind of started in the late 80s you know all i kind of late 80s and then in the 90s because you know i, I was uh, i graduated high school in 92 yeah um so i was uh, uh but you know huge fan of uh, you know i mean grunge I, I, of grunge yeah yeah you know, but prior, prior to that you know i mean i you know i grew up right by irvine meadows so you know i you know i'd go to i'd go see danzig and i'd go see oh, you know yeah. uh typo negative and whoever oh, yeah. you know whoever else at at uh, Irvine Meadows but then when I graduated high school I, I ended up in Seattle and I was wow. in, I was in Seattle in 92 which was right at the right kind of right, that's, in, that's right at the, the ground peak, right? zero man and so um you know kind of early rock and roll but then it kind of turned into you know the grunge scene for me so 92 I moved to Seattle um right out of high school and you know I'm listening to the radio and they're like hey you know Anybody that makes their way over to Gas Huffer Park in 45 minutes, Pearl Jam's there with a free concert. And I'm like, wow. like, holy shit, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it was that kind of stuff. Or we were at uh, Western Washington University up in Bellingham, and we're at a Mud Honey concert, right? Awesome. And we're there, and it's, you know, it's late. It's probably 11 or 12 o'clock, and who shows up but Nirvana, you know? Oh, just wow. as kind of a get And so I'm like, you know, so for me, that was, like, you know, this was 92, you know? Yeah, yeah. This was yeah. just, it was it. That's you know, it, man. It was it was like living the dream. So I, being in Seattle at that point in time, you know, I saw everybody. I mean, uh, you know, Soundgarden. Uh, you know, saw. Um, uh, what about Mad Season or anything like that? Nah. That's the main Staley side band. How about uh, Mother Love Bone? Mo oh, Mother Love. Bo well, Mother Love Bone was Temple just a, it was, Mother Love Bone was just a little bit before that. Right, so they yeah, were like they ninety. Turned into Pearl Jam. They turned into Pearl right. Jam. So, um, so I didn't. I you know I never saw Mother Love Bone, but I obviously you know I spent some time uh, you know. But yeah, um, the Melvins. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I all mean, that good all shit. That, all that yeah. sub pop stuff. Yeah. Man. There was a, there was a band called Small, which um, man, I've, I've I've been trying to. It was a, a kind of a Northwest. Anyways, just crazy stuff. So living in Seattle. Um, what were you doing in Seattle? So. I graduated from high school in 92 in yep. at, at Tribuco Hills High School, and I had built my little 356 race car that I'd been racing for a couple of years here in Southern California. And then in 92, I decided to go up to Portland and uh, race my car. And that's where I met my first customer was racing in Portland. And I ended up having a guy that um, uh, in Seattle that wanted me to take care of his car collection. So I packed up, moved to, to Seattle, and uh, he lived. just had a collection. You would live there and work on his yep, stuff. Yeah, working on stuff there. What kind of guy was that? Like a like a, a dot com guy or something? Yeah, well, it was, there's there's a lot of these guys that have collections of cars that that need somebody to to do some work on them. And, so uh, you're living at his I'm pad. Li I'm li well out. I, there was a, a loft above the shop. Wow. And so, you know, here's a big workshop full of Porsches, and there was a an apartment above it. And so I lived up there for about a year and so yeah that was my life for uh for a year in seattle i was that's cool living above shit. above a porsche shop working on stuff and going to as many concerts as i could you what know? kind of shit did the guy have um like everything he, like one of each he had a career two lightweight which was a, a really badass car he had uh 914 6 gt uh, um he had a uh one of those lamborghini lm 002s which looked like a a hummer have you ever seen the off-road oh, yeah that's so he had, crazy so he had a, a lamborghini lm 002 um 
He had uh, some Mini Coopers, a bunch of other stuff. So, yes, some really cool cars. And so I was working on the cars. You just tune them up and work on them and then And then helping him go, you know, at the races and that type of stuff. So so I did that for about a year. And then, uh, you know, that ended up ending in in 93. And then kind of went back to, you know, building my own stuff. And ended up landing in McMinnville, Oregon, about an hour outside of Portland. And uh, set up shop there. And, uh, Pretty nice went, up there, huh? Oh, it's beautiful. I love it. I still have a 50-acre ranch up there with oh, uh, with buildings, and that's where my business operated for 20 years. Wow. And yeah. what brought you back to L.A., the money? Uh, my son, that kid right there. Oh, he, yeah. Uh, he was racing go-karts when he was a kid um, mm-hmm. and uh, ended up winning a, a Oregon State vocal championship. He, he didn't want to race go-karts. He wanted to sing and act. Wow. But he ended up, uh, out of about 1,000 kids, uh, won this vocal championship, and that... One thing led to another. He ended up um, doing a couple plays and then got an agent in L.A. And next thing you know, he's on a Disney show. And Wow, what well, uh, one? Uh, he was on I'm in the Band, which right. is a, kind of oh, a yeah, you know, yeah, rock yeah. band. Uh, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. So he was, yeah, so he was on I'm in the Band. And then he was, uh, he was on uh, Shake It Up and a couple others uh, kicking it. And then he ended up um, on a show called Shameless on, uh, oh, on yeah. Showtime. Oh, wow. And then he just finished, uh, there's a show 24 that Kiefer Sutherland oh, yeah, was yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, my boy, uh, my boy uh, Kevin's uh, on the new reboot, Kevin well, Christie, yeah. co-host on this show. Oh, well, Zane was in the first four episodes. Oh, yeah, shooting out in Atlanta. Yep, he was yeah. in Atlanta for uh, three months. Yeah, my boy so, was on the show, he played the bad guy, they he, killed him last week or whatever, two weeks ago. Yeah, so Zane played, he was the, the lead in the B storyline, so he was the kid that that um uh the girl that was the terrorist that was blown up that ended up blowing up the bridge right he's the one that was uh gonna narc her off and then she ended up killing him or trying to kill him and then uh after she attempted to kill him and he got away then she filled his uh bloodstream with air in the hospital so he was in the first four episodes of 24 wow. legacy that's great so uh, he's out here working man he's been he's been at it for nine years yeah so that's up, what brings you out here he that's what, something and you have to move here because he's on the disney well, show what what happened was you know i operated my business in oregon for 20 years and um in 2009 my son's like dad i want to try this he's you know 10 year old kid yeah and i said you know zane I'll, your mom will take you down there if you have a little bit of success I'll give you six months. If you have some success in six months, I'll consider a lifestyle change and, and move my business and my employees to or, or you know from Oregon to yeah. California. Well, y- you know you you don't really think it's going to actually happen when yeah. you say that, but you know within six months he'd already done a pilot for CBS. He did Audi commercials and he was on uh, a Disney show and did an episode of Desperate Housewives. So I was like, shit, man, I gotta I gotta put my money where my mouth is and move wow. the shop. So uh, I spent a few years living in Oregon. Uh, you know, on the during the week and flying back down here to be with my wife and kids on the weekend. So it was a big sacrifice to wow. let him kind of follow his yeah. his dream. But then uh, in the end, I just said, heck with it. Let's pack up. You know, I, I want to be a family 24 hours a day. Yeah. And um, yeah, he's been a working actor for se- well, since 2009. So yeah, eight years. Uh, my, I'm good friends with uh, Jesse Metcalf, who was the gardener on Desperate Housewives, yeah. and he has a 964 now, and uh, we're both like, you know, way into the cars and everything. Yeah. It's funny how it's just full circle, you know. The number of Porsches on the road is unbelievable. Yeah. Each day, I could easily take a photo of like 50 of them. Right. Each day. It's crazy. Like, even if you ran out of these 356s, you could service people's cars for the rest of your life. You know, like, oh, yeah. I mean, you're like, no matter what, you're good to go your whole life. I mean, that would be boring as shit. But I'm just saying, it's crazy how many of these cars are around here. It is. It's, It's nuts. Well, you know, California, if you look at all the Porsches that were built, especially in the early days, you know, Porsche's production models, it was something like half of the production models came to california is that right or came to the u.s yeah and then half of the u.s cars came to california so that means technically 20 to 25 percent of the cars came right here wow to uh yeah that's incredible man uh all right let's go look at your collection i can't thank you enough for having me. hey my pleasure man you know these cars uh they blow my mind i I, I, I still can't imagine them being fast, you know, because I've never <laughs> been in one. Yeah. But uh, they look insane. And the James Dean one to me is absolutely the high watermark of the of the Porsche era. You know, it's bitten me again. And everyone that loves this car, uh, these cars are freaks about them. Oh, you know? 
They, they are, you know. I, I mean, I always tell people that, you know, people say, what is it about these Porsches? And I tell them, you know, it's not just about acquiring a car when you get one, man. It's like having a family member. They're, yeah. they're, they're something that kind of get into your soul. Yeah. And uh, they're a car that, kinda, that that has a special meaning. It's not just transportation. There's a whole culture that, that surrounds it. Um, it's like Harley Davidson. Yeah, exactly, you, you know? know. It's the it, same it's, thing. It's, and, and, and I think that I'm... I'm I'm looking forward to diving way deep into it and learning stuff about it. Yep. You know what I mean? Because I do. Uh, just in a week now, I've been like, oh, okay, you don't want to get this one because of this. Like, there's weird one things like, oh, in '74, the motor was terrible or something. Exactly. Whatever, you know, and it, it, and when I was younger, I knew everything about a, a vintage guitar, uh, a Tele, a Strat, and a Les Paul. Yep. You know, and and I'm looking forward to getting into that with these cars. You right know? on, man. Well, let's go check out some cars. Yeah, thank Thank you so much. And where can people find you? And uh, you got an Instagram. Yeah, I mean, the best place is uh, you can always go to our website, which is emorymotorsports.com. You e got a cool shirt. E M E M O R Y. And then, uh, or Instagram's kind of the, the most uh, relevant and current content all the time. I, you know, I'm daily poster and always commenting on there. So that's just my name. It's Rod, R O D M R E E M O R Y. And uh, yeah, so if you love Porsches or. Uh, you know, things that surround that. Check or it out. Or handmade shit, man. Yeah. I mean, that's what this show's all about, you know? Exactly. Having people that make stuff by hand. Cool, man. Have you, uh, one last question. Have you done a car like your dream car? Yeah, I mean, uh, when I show you some of the cars, you'll you'll see some of the stuff that I've done. But the car that is my Emery Special, the the very first one that I, you know, really uh, changed all the lines and 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 built. That's you know, to me, that's like the dream car. That's the, the you know, my favorite car of all time. That's badass. All right, yeah. let's go take a look. Cool, man. Thanks, guys, for tuning in, and don't forget to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes and uh, say hi to Rod and let him know you heard about it right here on Let There Be Talk. See you guys. Right on.